So today we're going to talk about the hour-long paintings assignment, which if you go through the first and second lecture dealing with still life, you'll need to do that before you review this. Um, this will harken back to the late work of Edward Manet, who, uh, dying of syphilis from his bedside, uh, chose to do these very, very humble, sparse, yet very beautiful, very economical paintings of simple subject matter. And when I say economical, what I'm referring to is a very sort of shorthanded brush mark um, with a very shallow space. You can see this evident in the later or the earlier works that are a little bit more complex, especially in his still lifes, but he was known for a very um, shorthanded, um, expressive way of putting down and laying down paint. Um, but these are particularly beautiful as they exhibit a kind of vulnerable voice, one that is very much about solitude, quiet, and the simplicity of the domestic interior and what we surround ourselves with. Paul Cezanne would also be a good reference for this. Um, I just have a few smaller still lives of his um, that do touch on what we're dealing with. However, just to review, he is dealing with playing with a broken space as a means to make a picture and not necessarily to paint an object. Uh, so they're not about rendering in so much as they're about the elements and principles of design. This is still being practiced today. Josephine Halverson is an artist uh, working today who makes all of her paintings in one session. If she's not able to do that, if she can't complete it, she will throw the painting away. Avigdor Rika, who died just a few years ago, also did this kind of approach to observational painting, uh, both through figures and the still life. He would paint them all in one session and complete them in a day. This entire movement is based off of an article that came out in the New York Times a good handful of years ago called Painting a Day. And it was based off of an artist who made a very, very livable income by making a painting every single day, photographing it and selling it before it was even dry. This has become an exercise, but it's also a means to cut out the middleman when it comes to selling your work. Um, here we have an entire project by an artist, Yujing Wang, who uh, focused exclusively for a whole series on the broken egg. Um, and it, it presents a challenge that will allow you to play with light without getting caught up, light and color, without getting caught up in uh, all of the sort of rigmarole of your setup in such a way that um, pulls you away from the act of simply creating a painting. Dwayne Kaiser is also one of these paintings of day artists. Here are some examples of his work. And TJ Murphy is also one of these artists that utilize the painting a day approach. Um, they get pretty formally um, kind of consistent. Um, that's not necessarily your objective here. So what the assignment is, is you'll be arranging a simple still life and you'll be lighting it using a clear and distinctive source. So use a, a clamp light, a lamp, or position your still life close to a window using direct sunlight. Use contrasting shapes, colors, and fabrics in order to assemble a one to three simple object still life. You're going to set an alarm timer and you're going to try to complete each painting in 60 minutes using the following parameters. There will be five paintings total that you will turn in. The first one you want to complete is a direct painting. Um, it's called a la prima to the first. It will be executed in full value with a full color palette, which we'll talk about in class with a demo. The second painting will be exclusively completed with just a palette knife. No brushes will be used in order to create this painting. You will be allowed a full color palette for this. The third one is using tints. So you can use a full color palette. However, for every single color, you'll be needing to use a tiny little bit of white. The objective here and the challenge is to achieve a full value range in order to do this. This can present some difficulty. 
Your fourth painting will um, be completed using only 30 strokes upon finish. You may take a lot of strokes in order to actually apply the paint on there. However, evident of the painting on the painting surface, there must be 30 strokes. It can be less than, but it can be no more than 30 evident strokes. And the strokes must be clear. I want to see them. I want um, you to focus on brush economy here. The fifth one, I want you to only use a palette devised by Anders Zorn, the 19th century artist. That palette is comprised entirely of cadmium red, yellow ochre, black, and white. Um, I've included on the rubric what that color wheel might actually look like, and I'll post that a little bit later. Some tips. Do not skimp on the paint you put on your palette. Many students will utilize um, just a tiny little bit, and you're you're going to spend a lot of time just going back and forth, squeezing the paint out of your out of your brushes and mixing, mixing, mixing. The more you use, the more likely you are to make very direct um, and immediate decisions. Try to mix out all of your colors before you even begin the painting on the palette. Okay, if you mix them all out and in their appropriate value schemes, you're much more likely to focus exclusively on applying the paint. Never use white for whites, and never use your black for darks. Do not darken or create a shadow using black, and do not lighten something based on white. You're looking for things like lavenders, things like light blues. You're looking for warm tints, possibly adding yellow ochre instead of white in order to lighten something. Um, in order to make something darker, oftentimes you add the complement, which is the rule of complements. Um, so below I have the question, am I using the rule of complements? Am I using the complement in order to darken um, the orange? Am I putting blue in that orange in order to create the turn of the form? The next thing is you never want to use more than three colors in order to mix a color. The reason why is you will never remember what you use to, in order to make that color. Also, the color is much more likely to turn into mud if you do. Um, utilize three main values and look for contrast. You want to have clear, distinctive, um, planar shifts that go from light, middle, to dark values. You want to choose a subject that is simple enough to execute in a limited period of time. If you've never painted glass before, that's probably not the best time to choose it. Think about things like fruits and vegetables. Um, things that you'll find around your house that have and will be able to reflect and reflect refract color in an interesting way. Plastic objects generally do not do this. Um, you want to make bold formal decisions and follow through. This is going to require an immediate and very clear um, practice in moving forward, not getting too caught up in doubts. When you're asking yourself whether or not a color is correct, ask yourself these questions. Is the light that's coming in cool or warm? Is it from the sun? If it's from the sun, it's probably a cool light, a sort of bluish light. If it's a bluish light, it will probably have a warm shadow. Is it warm? Well, if it's an incandescent light, yeah, it probably is. And if it's a warm light, it's probably going to be a cool shadow. You want to ask yourself, are you using the rule of complements? Are you adding the complement in order to darken the local value or the local color of a structure? And then thirdly, do I see reflected light or color? If I'm putting an orange on a red tablecloth, that red tablecloth is going to bounce right back up into that orange, and I will see it in the orange. So you always want to look out for that. Make sure that you use it. That is the assignment. Thank you very much.